<laughs> Sorry about that. You would think after almost three years <laughs> that I would not have done that. But welcome everyone uh, to this session, um, the first NCME session of the new year on media coverage of educational testing. We have a great panel of veteran journalists. Um, so I'm going to just do some introductions. So our first uh, presenter will be Katherine Gewertz with the Center for Assessment. Prior to becoming the editorial director at the Center for Assessment this past August, Dr. Gewertz has spent 20 plus years as a reporter at Education Week covering assessment among other things. She was also the recipient of NCME's inaugural Excellence in Public Communication Award in 2019 for coverage of assessment. She also has 20 plus years as a reporter at the Los Angeles Times and UPI. Next, we will have Tim Schwab, a freelance journalist um, based in Washington, DC, who has written for The Nation, the Columbia Journalism Review, and the British Medical Journal, and represents some of the only investigative journalism ever published on the Gates Foundation. His book on the Gates Foundation's relationship with journalism is out soon from Metropolitan Books. And then we will have A.P. Dillon with North State Journal. She's a reporter based near Raleigh, North Carolina and publisher of More to the Story on Substack. She describes herself as mom, wife, sarcasm, aficionado, and reporter. And last, we will have Richard Phelps with the Nonpartisan Education Group and he is also currently the chair of NCME's Informing Assessment Policy Committee. So Catherine, the floor is yours. Great, hello to everybody. I'm so glad we've got such a great gang here today. I see a bunch of my people from the center, yay. Best people ever. Let me share my screen and tell you a little bit about um, why why I'm here today and what I want to talk about, which is building a relationship with reporters. Why should you bother? So there's a reason to bother. We are a bother. I still say we because I'm still kind of a reporter at heart. Um, so we are worth bothering with. Um, we are irritating. And I'll talk a little bit about why we can be irritating. Um, but I think working with us um, in, in maybe different ways than you have before could be worth your while. So, yes, it's frustrating to work with us sometimes. Sometimes reporters are only interested in disasters, like when there's a really awful test administration, suddenly you get calls, but not the rest of the year. Um, sometimes they bring predetermined narratives, which need to be dealt with. And they will probably oversimplify what you want to say, which can be frustrating. Uh, reporters often don't get very much about assessment and accountability. Um, that you stand a better chance with trade publications. There's a little more expertise there. But in mainstream media, um, there's not that kind of expertise. And that's something that you have to deal with. This is my, maybe how you feel when, when a reporter calls. But I'm going to tell you why you don't need to feel that way. I think there's some good strategies and techniques you can bear in mind. So here's a little explanation about why you might experience what you do with reporters. Um, they, and I still want to say we, are really spread thin. Media outlets are increasingly understaffed. It's annoying for them. They want more time to do things too and often don't have it. It's also annoying for the people they call because... It's all very rushed and very last minute sometimes. Unfortunately, it is what it is, as they say. Uh, reporters often are annoying in another way. They call with a lot of demands that they need everything right away. Um, news actually does break sometimes and you have to chase it. You have to respond and that's fast. Um, when it's not breaking though, every news media outlet has an ongoing need for stories. So demand for uh, fresh copy. Remember that this is in our DNA. We are there to report for the public good, to share information for the public that everyone deserves to know. So this is why it can feel a little bit being put upon sometimes, I think. We're there to report important things and we need you to help us. Reporters are not usually measurement people. They're not usually science people. 
And this makes reporting on assessment very hard. I know firsthand when I started reporting on it, it was quite overwhelming. Um, it requires science, it requires numbers. And for all my years in journalism, there weren't a lot of math majors in newsrooms, or science majors were English majors, were poli sci majors. And, you know, reporters, in addition to talking to you, probably have a couple more stories to do that week. So this all makes interviewing and dealing with us a little bit uh, dif difficult, but not, not unsolvable. I really like to urge people to do what I call little C communication, which is start building relationships with, with education reporters when there isn't a breaking story. Connect, have lunch. If you can't have lunch, have coffee. If you can't have coffee, have a Zoom coffee. Just connect and make a relationship. Uh, reporters hopefully would reach out to you to do this, but if they don't, you can reach out to them. Find out who covers education. Find out who might cover um, a big assessment administration or any other topic. See if you could just call up and have an off the record informal chat. I say pull up a bar stool, meaning start brushing up on how to talk to regular people. You probably do this all the time at cocktail parties. When people say, what do you do for a living? You have to have a way of explaining to ordinary people. And that's a great approach with reporters too, who are not expert in assessment. Remember that when you talk to reporters, you'll be able to get a few key points across. You won't be able to explain everything. It's like that old saying about, please don't tell me how to build a watch. Just tell me what time it is. So um, remember to simplify um, in your interviews. You're going to have to put up with a lot of ignorance and not understanding stuff. We just beg your patience and uh, repeated explanations. Some of the folks at the center know this all too well for me. I drag them through, through long interviews. Please tell me, please explain again. I still don't get it. And I believe it paid off. Their patience paid off with better coverage. Um, this part's a little tricky, right? I think reporters really want to be responsible about any assessment topic they're covering, um, a new test design, for instance, or a recent test administration, what might have gone wrong, and being frank about acknowledging the strengths and the weaknesses of whatever it is you are happening to talk about will build your credibility among reporters um, who are suspicious of a pitch. Um, anyway, just a thought to consider. Ongoing relationship, back to that again. I believe that ongoing uh, conversations, when there isn't a story at hand, really build an understanding of the topic and help somebody report on it better. When a reporter does call, remember, there are a few things that are great for you to ask. What's your deadline? Uh, you also don't have to feel hurried into responding right then when you're on the phone. It's really okay to say, all right, I need to know what information you want. Do you just want quotes from me? Do you want perspective? Do you actually need some kind of data that I might need time to retrieve for you? Find out what they want and then schedule a callback that's within their deadline. That way you're prepared. You've thought a little bit about what you want to say. You've got the information they want. That can help you and them both. You might consider asking to talk off the record or on background for part of the interview. Usually reporters want you on the record and they will presume you're on the record. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. But from the minute you're on the phone, you're presumed to be on the record. So if there's something you don't want published or you want to just chat or get an explanation, ask to go off the record or on background for part of the interview. And you can do part of it on the record. I'll tell you about that in a sec. But the last thing you can do when a reporter calls is ask them for a sense of the story. What's your story really about? What are you hoping to explore? How are you coming at it? How are you framing it? And that allows you to reframe for them if you think that's appropriate and uh, if they've got it wrong. And it allows you to prepare. I can uh, leave these slides with you so you can keep them. But here are the generally accepted definitions of the ways that you speak and how attribution goes in an interview. On the record means everything's fair game. Every word that comes out of your mouth, everything you say can be published and attributed to you. On background means they can use what you say, but they can't attribute it to you. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, this is where you want to get them to agree what kind of attribution they're gonna use. 
If you're a high ranking executive at a text publishing company and you want to explain some things to a reporter, you're going to want to know, like, let's agree on what attribution you're going to use. Are you going to call me a senior executive at a test design company? You want to work with them and agree on the kind of attribution that's comfortable for you. Off the record means not a word that comes out of your mouth can ever see the light of day. So it's important to know the distinctions there and just double check with the reporter you're talking to that their understanding of on background or off the record is the same as yours. So, you know, you don't want any misunderstandings about who's being quoted and if you're being quoted. Once again, some of this stuff sounds repetitive, right? Just reinforcing some important ideas here. You're going to have to keep it simple and find a way of responding about technical, complicated things in a pretty direct, simple way. And I know that's frustrating. It's frustrating for everybody involved. You'll have to be patient and explain and explain again. Really good to offer some big picture context. Why is the reporter calling about this? Why do you, as the person being interviewed, think any of this matters? Why is it important for the public to know about? And yes, it does feel difficult when you can't completely control the message, but that's the nature of working with a reporter. Remember, it's about educating the public, not pitching a product or a point of view. A lot of patient explaining is required and they're really not out to get you. Um, and do build that ongoing public relationship, that relationship with them, it really lends itself to helping the public understand what you're doing. Here's where you can find me. And with that, I will yield to the next person. Thanks for listening. Thank you so uh, much, Catherine. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tim. Um, hi, yes. So I'm Tim Schwab. I'm a freelance journalist. I am writing a book about the Gates Foundation. Um, it's not specifically uniquely about Gates' uh, relationship with the news media, but that is part of what I'm reporting in the book. Um, so the prompt for today's talk, um, some of the questions asked in the prompt is how closely does news coverage of education match the standards and ideals of journalism? And what advice can we give to those working at education testing for working successfully with the press? Um, one thing you can do is you can create... Um, if you manage to create an operating system that is very widely used on computers around the world and you gain a personal fortune of 100 or 150 billion dollars you can start a philanthropy and start donating money to journalism and that will very very effectively get your message out into the news media so i'm being tongue-in-cheek here but what i'm talking about is bill gates and the gates foundation um, which is kind of a narrow focus that's my narrow entry point into this conversation but hopefully it's still useful for people on the call um, in 2020, writing for Columbia Journals and Review, I looked at every charitable grant the Gates Foundation had ever given. It was 20 some thousand at the time. And I found more than $250 million that the Gates Foundation has given to the news media in charitable grants, donations, essentially to the news media. Um, it's actually probably, it could be double or triple that number because of um, a lack of transparency in how the Gates Foundation reports its information. It's hard to know exactly, but it's, it was, more than $250 million at the time I looked at it. And a lot of this money is earmarked for reporting on education. So you can find grants going to NPR, Seattle Times, Gannett, Medium, The Atlantic, Inside Higher Ed, Chronicle of Higher Education, Ed Week, Ed Surge, The 74, Chalkbeat. The list goes on and on. Um, but what's happening is the Gates Foundation is able to donate money to a newsroom and, and to um, asked that it be used specifically for reporting on a topic that the Gates Foundation works on, like education. And what that does is it empowers a newsroom to work on an issue that the Gates Foundation also works on. At the same time that the foundation's doing that, it's also flooding money into advocacy groups, think tanks, universities, um, who are the export, expert sources that these journalists are quoting. So there are times and places where you have a Gates-funded newsroom who's uh, reporting on a Gates-funded initiative in education, and all the expert sources um, cited are um, also funded by the Gates Foundation. So it's, it's really an extraordinary level of epistemic power to shape what we know and, and how we think about uh, the Gates Foundation and the projects it works on. And 
you know, as, as I've reported on it in just also in my own career as a journalist who's trying to uh, bring some accountability to the Gates Foundation in a media landscape that's flooded with Gates Foundation funding, um, my conclusion is that Gates funding is actually really bad for, um, for the news media, that um, it's hard to see it as charity because the Gates Foundation derives so much benefit from this giving. Um, when Gates um, funds the news media, it's, it's buying goodwill from the, from the news media. It's making it hard for that newsroom funded by Gates to put a critical lens on the Gates Foundation. Um, I mean, it's kind of, I think, self-evident, but the target of your investigation can't also be the funder of your investigation. It's just a conflict of interest. And Gates, you know, if you want to call it generous, uh, we, we can call it that, but Gates generous funding in the news media, I think is one reason why uh, journalists have been so bad at looking at um, the Gates Foundations um, as a structure of power. And this is where I'm going to get really big picture is, you know, for people on the call who are interested in, um, you know, media coverage of education testing, let's just say more generally media coverage of public policy. Um, you know, I think probably, hopefully most of us are concerned about misinformation. Most of us want to have a spirited, vigorous public debate based on truth, based on facts. Um, and to do that, we really need a, a free and open press that is independent. I'm not going to say objective, but we need one that's independent. And when there are, you know, when we recreate the media landscape in such a way that the um, a super powerful, super wealthy special interest like the Gates Foundation, which has a, a very kind of particular and narrow ideological interest in, in any kind of education policy we look at, um, it's, it's really, um, it diminishes the independence of the news media. And I think it also is going to hurt public trust. Um, so if we want people um, to think about public, if we want the media to be, um, you know, fostering public debate and analyzing power dynamics and holding structures of power to account, um, we have to think uh, long and hard about, um, you know, creating a media landscape that really is independent and that can live up to these, um, these ideals and standards of what journalism should be. Um, there's an old uh, bromide in journalism that you're supposed to afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. So you afflict the comforted, that's challenging structures of power, and then you comfort the afflicted. So you're kind of looking out for the little guy, the little person. Um, and in educational policy, the Gates Foundation clearly is a structure of power. It's, um, it's one of the most powerful voices in education in the United States. Um, and it should be scrutinized as a structure of power, not exalted as an unimpeachable, sacrosanct um, charity. Um, so all of that said, I, I do want to quickly, you know, as I close out here, just, just say that it's not that the Gates Foundation has absolute power over the news media. Yes, the foundation's putting hundreds of millions of dollars into it, but there have always been, um, you know, great independent journalists who've been willing to put a critical lens to the foundation, including on education and perhaps especially on education. Um, and one that I'll draw your attention to was an Associated Press article in 2018 by writer um, Sally Ho. Um, and she's looking at the implementation of the Every Student Succeeds Act um, and looking at tens of millions of dollars that the foundation gave to generate friendly media coverage and help write one state's new educational system framework. Um, so the reporting says the grants illustrate how strategic and immersive the Microsoft founder can be in pursuit of his educational reform agenda, quietly wielding national influence over how schools operate. Gates' carefully curated web of influence is often invisible, but allows his foundation to drive the conversation in support of its vision on how to reshape America's struggling schools. And in that story, they looked at the, um, an, an education media outlet called the 74 Media, which is funded by the Gates Foundation and which was profiling um, Gates' work, um, a Gates-funded project, and it, all the expert sources cited in the article were funded by Gates, and none of this was disclosed to readers. Um, and, and this is really where you get to the issue of public trust. Um, you know, I think there is a temptation to view this idea that the masses are asses, that the, the people are stupid. And I really would push back on that idea. Um, I think that people can see clearly a conflict of interest 
when it appears. Um, and they're not going to be fooled by um, it, all this is doing is it, generating public dis distrust. So it's money of, one of many ways that I think the Gates Foundation's funding of journalism is doing far more harm than good. Um, and, you know, to the extent that we believe that journalism plays an important role in a strong democracy, they call it the fourth estate, um, a fourth layer of checks and balances beyond the president, the Congress, the courts. I, I think we should understand that we, it's, if we want a, a strong democracy, we need a strong journalism, and that means it has to be independent. We have to um, really rethink the ability of um, you know, very wealthy, very powerful actors like the Gates Foundation to just, you know, underwrite the news media, underwrite journalism that we're reading. Um, you know, my own view is that it just presents a specter of almost oligarchy, where the, the richest guy has the loudest voice. Um, I don't think that that ethos should be anywhere near um, the journalism and, and the press. Um, so that's my perspective on this issue. Um, and happy to take questions and hand it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Tim. AP? Hey there, everybody. Um, my name is AP Dillon. I'm a reporter with the North State Journal. Um, I've been with this publication for about four years now. Um, prior to that, I was the uh, North Carolina Bureau Chief for the Tennessee Star. And I don't have a traditional journalism upbringing. Um, I started out in the blogosphere way back in the early 2000s and gained such a following that I was picked up by policy journals um, and national outlets, including Fox News. Um, <clears throat> the topic that I was normally paid for was, and I had a passion for it because I had two children in public school um, and elementary school at the time. And what frustrated me about coverage that I read by other outlets was the lack of um, accessibility to the documents, the reports, the spreadsheets, the, the actual data that was being reported on. And I would have to go and search for that for myself. So one of my tips to those dealing with the, with the media um, would be to offer them all the documentation that you possibly can so that they can attach it to their reports or make it available for their readers to go view without having to go search for it because most people don't have the time to do that. Um, and when it comes to reporting managing, I, I call it reporting, I don't call it journalism. Reporting means you see what's going on here, you see the topic, you see the pictures, the who, what, where, when, and then the why should be left to the reader. So you're giving them the nuts and bolts in an explainable shorthand fashion with as much detail as possible without losing your reader. Um, and that's the way you should engage in your conversations. Just like Dr. Gort said, you need to develop those relationships with the reporters. I've developed relationships with all kinds of education officials in the state of North Carolina, from the superintendent all the way down to legislators, down to school board members and communications directors and those sort of folks. They all know who I am and they all know that when I ask a question, I mean it. <laughs> um, now, linking to the source materials is great. Um, keeping the quotes simple and digestible is also something that will help the reporters. Um, when you get too much into the weeds, you're going to get the constant having to re-explain things to them. Um, unless you're someone like me who's been steeped in education forever and they're going to understand that. The, the same thing goes with acronyms. If you're, if you're just spewing out a bunch of acronyms, education acronyms, your reporter's eyes are going to glaze over and they're going to look at you like, hey, what? <laughs> um, so be specific in the language that you use. If you do use an acronym, explain what that is or you know, point them to where they can read more about what that means. And in educational testing, the thing that comes up the most in the reporting or the questions I get from the parents are, is the so what behind it. So these test scores this year were different than last year's and were different than the year before. Is there a historical difference in there? Is the, you know, where, where's the so what? How is this uh, drilling down locally? If you're doing a local reporting, or we've got a local reporter calling. How is this drilling down locally into the school district that impacts them? Be able to point the reporter to the area where they can find that data, where they can find that historical information and back up their reporting. Um, 
And reporters shouldn't assume that the public reading their article understands the acronyms either. And so you might have to be doing some explaining there too. Um, the thing that uh, I wanted to go to with what, um, with what Tim was saying is you need to ask yourself sometimes when you get a reporter calling, who is this outlet? What's the goal of their story as Dr. Gortz mentioned? Um, you know, who's this outlet doing the reporting? Are they an actual news outlet? Like the North State Journal is the only statewide newspaper in North Carolina. We are subscription driven. We don't have, um, you know, think tank backers. The big thing these days that I've seen is this advocacy journalism that has popped up where nonprofits are funding to the tunes of millions and millions of dollars. Some of these organizations that are, are not actual news outlets, they are advocacy outfits and they just do blog posts <laughs> in, in essence. Um, so you need to be careful about the information that you're handing over, who you're talking to. You have to understand who you're talking to. Um, and going back to being specific about language, when you're talking about acronyms and you're talking about, um, you know, for, for example, you know, you wouldn't really see this in testing so much, but in general policy, uh, a pet peeve of mine is the term vouchers. That can mean a lot of things. In a lot of states, it's not necessarily a, a voucher, a school voucher, or that sort of thing. Like in North Carolina, it is the um, Opportunity Scholarship Program. These are actual literal grant scholarships that are given individually to students. They're not necessarily a blank check voucher. So there's some explanation that has to go behind that. Um, but when it comes to the testing part of it, um, navigating national websites that deal with national testing like the NAEP and places like that, trying to navigate those as a reporter can be a labyrinthian task. I mean, it, trying to find the nuts and bolts for the data that you're being given information about from your source is very difficult. So if you're someone in the communications office or you're somebody um, at, a, at a testing firm or a publisher or that sort of thing, being able to point the reporter to the actual source or pull down the information for them or send them to the link, that's extraordinarily helpful. And it's gonna get you, get them off your back asking for more information. Um, I would like to <clears throat> also, on the reporter side of things, once the report comes out, it's hard to, con like she said, like Dr. Gort said, it's hard to control the narrative. You're not really sure how that report is going to come out after you talk to the reporter. Hopefully, what you said is being represented fairly. Um, however, on the reporter side of things, something that you know I've watched myself on, and I've watched other reporters fall into these pitfalls, is uh, the use of adjectives. If your reporter contains more than one or two adjectives, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, let the let the material speak for itself. Let the quote speak for itself. Don't interject your own personal view of what this material is. Let, let, the, let the documents do their own talking. And to remember that for on the reporter side and on the education side, your audience is parents and families and school districts and other policymakers. So keeping these things in line with what's actually fact versus opinion that might be bubbling up there about a particular topic. You need to tread lightly there. Um, and tied into that is a mission of fact or um, an alternate point of view. You know, if your testing company is telling you one thing about this test, well, where's an alternate test out there that you can go look at? And a, another example that you can go look at and someone else you can go talk to and compare the two you know, like the ACT and the SAT, what are the two differences? A lot of reporters don't get that nuance between the two of them exactly where they stand and why colleges are taking some and why are some taking the other. So it's a fine line to tread, but I would just ultimately make the connection with the reporter, figure out who they are and be very specific and very deliberate in the language that you use or the response that you give them. And again, don't feel rushed to get to us the information just because we're sitting there saying we've got a deadline for tomorrow. Sometimes we do and we'll hound you for it. <laughs> but in, in reality, we usually have at least a couple days lead time. Um, 
so that's those are sort of just the key things that I've seen coming out of testing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of movements out there and you have to be careful which sources that you go with. If you're gonna go with an activist on one side of the aisle, you need to go with an activist on the other side of the aisle. Same thing when it comes to the testing companies and the publishing companies. If you've got one publishing company telling you one thing, go out there and look for another publishing company and see what their opinion is on it and present both side by side. That's where I am on that. Thanks so much, AP. Richard. Okay, I'm gonna to try to share screen here. See if it works. Um, Okay. Oh man, okay. Um Okay, sorry, I'm a privacy settings. Um uh not set up right. Okay. So can you see my screen? No? Oh, okay. So I got to do it over again. Sorry. Now can you see it? All right, great. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. I think it's especially important that journalists cover research and source expertise fairly and validly. Unlike with other news stories, what expert sources say is often presented as truth and fact. Like me, some of you may have noticed, however, that some names appear frequently and others never. Some journalists have openly admitted to our committee that they rely on go-to sources, individuals they repeatedly consult over time. Unfortunately, often one journalist's go-to source is other journalists' go-to source as well. So is bias the problem? This graphic shows my accounting of a couple years worth of coverage of the Common Core standards in just one publication. I compared the number of mentions and links to sources openly advocating in favor or against. In favor wins by several hundred mentions. In this case, the editor at the time also had an organization receiving many millions from the Gates and Allied Foundations. So bias may explain some journalist favoritism or some of journalist favoritism, but I think there are structural professional issues as well. The Education Writers Association is a national group of education journalists. In 2016, they asked their members how they source stories. The first source type requires money and organization, something common among groups accepting government or foundation money and non-existent among truly independent outsiders. The second source type, which some cynically might call PAC journalism, simply multiplies the effect of the first. In sum, many of today's education journalists expect stories to come to them and apparently assume that what comes to them is representative of all there is. I have spent some time simply counting who some journalists source for research expertise. I've looked only at nationally focused journalists who also writes stories on education research. It's tedious work counting what we now call mentions. Among over 100 expert names I searched for, including some of our profession's leading authorities, most were never consulted. Political scientists theorize that journalists and politicians consider sources only within an acceptable familiar range. 
and exclude all those considered outside that range, those considered unimportant, extreme, or whatever. To my observation, some types of uh, uh, expert sources are overrepresented. Uh, economists, uh, think tankers at national think tanks, uh, those at the, the most prestigious universities, Ivy League, Stanford, so on, and those at well-funded research centers. Underrepresented are psychologists, program evaluators, most non-academic practitioners, most universities, in short, the unaligned and truly, and all the un unaligned and truly oh, I independent. I said about having the witch hazel because I got to bring some to my mom. Uh, summing up, uh, overrepresented in my in my opinion, are those who consider uniquely promoting their research to the public and policymakers to be ethical and professional and have the money to do it. Underrepresented are those who consider uniquely promoting their research to the public um, to be uh, unethical or unprofessional or lack the money to do it. Here is a list of, uh, sorry, I missed, uh, missed the page. Oh, the next, these next few slides will focus on the person I estimate to be expert source number one among research focused national education journalists. He is the most frequently sourced expert scholar across several publications and organizations. And here is a list of topics on which which journalists at just two of those organizations presented him as an expert source. I'm not expecting you to read the entire list. I will summarize for you. First, the topics are spread all over the education domain. K-12, higher ed, school choice, finance, gifted education, tracking, scholarships, medications for students, testing, and so on. Second, this scholar has specific training or work experience in no more than a few of these topics. So how did he become the most fre frequently sourced expert across several national publications? First, he maintains constant contact with education journalists. He's always nearby and easy to reach when journalists have a deadline. This table lists the number of specific contacts he made via Twitter tweets, both coming and going over a recent 15 month period. Mind you, Twitter's just one of many communication media he probably uses, and these are just the top 10 journalist targets. There are many others. Second, not only does he maintain constant contact with journalists, he also frequently compliments them. Here are just four of 100 compliments on Twitter I noted before I stopped looking. And remember, this is just one communication medium over just one 15 month period. Conversely, he never criticizes their work. Now, most of us do not have the time and resources to do what expert scholar number one does to attract journalists' attention. Some of us may even think that such behavior is not ethical. How does expert scholar number one do it? He works for an organization that has accepted over $10 million from the Gates Foundation alone, and more from other allied foundations such as the Waltons. This is, a, this is his full-time job. He's paid for this. They have accepted money from Gates for the written contractual purpose of promoting the Common Core standards, not conducting objective research on Common Core, but explicitly to promote Common Core. I have yet to find a news story where this obvious conflict of interest is noted, however. Expert scholar number one is described in the ways shown here as someone who just happens to personally like Common Core. Finally, expert number one belongs to a group of scholars who consistently reference each other. A citation cartel is a group of scholars who cite each other and ignore or dismiss work from outside their group. Here's a simple model of the advantage. 
Assume 20 scholars with 10 publications a year, each with 10 citations. 10 strategic scholars cite only each other's work. 10 sincere scholars cite everyone's work. The result, over time, strategic scholars triple sincere scholars' citation numbers. And citation numbers are used prominent, are prominently considered in many hiring promotion, <laughs> promotion and award decisions. In my opinion, the most insidious uh, behavior among some journalists is, is what is commonly called explainer journalism. And that's whereby a journalist decides who and what is correct in research and delivers only that evidence and point of view to readers and listeners. This is, this is what AP was talking about earlier. Not a reporter, they're, they're journalists, they're above reporting. Explainer journalism is currently being vigorously promoted by journalists' current favorite, favorite expert sources who, who benefit from this. Frustrated by the skewed, what I consider to be skewed coverage of policy issues by nationally focused education journalists, I joined the Society of Professional Journalists. The SPJ publishes an impressively thick book on media ethics. I list here some elements of that code that I observe are persistently ignored by some of the most prominent US education journalists. Why the skewed sourcing and coverage? Uh, as Tim uh, suggested, perhaps related, the Education Writers Association, Education Week, the Heckinger Report, the 74 and Chalkbeat have also accepted many millions from the Gates and Allied Foundations. Representatives of interest groups now comprise most of the EWA board. There remain just two working journalists on the 12-member board who might not be directly or indirectly paid by the Gates Foundation and allies. For those who wish to learn more about uh, this depressing state of affairs, you can read my forthcoming book. Thank you. All right, thank you, Richard. And thank all of our presenters um, for that um, informative session. <laughs> and I opened all the links in the chat as well, so I can go back and, and read them. We will now open the floor for questions. Richard, can you state the name of your upcoming book again? Oh, uh, the the malfunction of U.S. education policy. Thank you. A question for Richard, actually, really quickly: was your was your example person? Uh, did they happen? Would that happen to be Michael Petrelli? Uh, it, I'm gonna make <laughs> you make you read the book. <laughs> I don't think this is the place to name names. Yeah, I recognize a lot of that. Any other questions? All right. Um, if there are no other questions, presenters, do you have any uh, final words? And I see you have some kudos in the chat. If you want to look at those, <laughs> the presenters. The only thing I would say is that just like they say, all politics is local, so is all reporting. Um, Always bear that in mind that when you're talking to a reporter, this is going to impact people, not just, you know, in the sphere of testing, but 
all the way down into school districts, policymakers, and again, down to the actual family and even the student itself. So bear that in mind when you're talking to your reporters and reporters also bear that in mind when asking your questions. Oh, just a one little small point, uh, reacting to Derek Briggs uh, comment. The 74 million is the name of the publication. The company is 74 Media. So when you look in uh, the Gates Foundation, at the Gates Foundation website, the money goes to 74 Media. So same thing, just different names. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I think we stunned and, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was all that man. information, all those uh, links and things and, and mentions. Everyone's going to go and, and read through them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see there's a question um, before everyone goes. Um, Deborah Harris says, so what we can do as NCM, what can we do as NCM members to try to fix this? Well, one one thing we're we're just about to do, and uh, Ethan and I will start on this next week. We we surveyed NCME members to to see um, who would be willing to serve as um, as contacts for journalists, and uh, we got a good response. And uh, assemble the database and uh, sometime in the next few weeks, we're, we're going to be sending this out to um, uh, over a thousand journalists or um, would be journalists, bloggers and, and whatnot. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens. So yeah, NCME is trying to do something about this to, to you know, spread the Spread the, spread the expertise list so uh, journalists have more people to talk to talk to. Thanks for mentioning that, Richard, and also thanks to you and your committee for all all of your hard work that um, you have done to to get to this spot. I know uh, you've been working on it, so yeah. Thanks again. Great, thank you, Kendra. All right, yeah. everyone, enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Bye. Thank you, everyone.